Welcome to my development lab. This is where I sort out most of the issues and challenges with RS Logix 5000, RS Logix Studio, and hardware, and RS Lynx, Factory Talk Lynx, etc. This is the first official presentation for the RS Logix Studio 5000 course. Uh, there are a couple other videos that uh, I've already produced. One on the difference between RS Logix and Studio. So you want to watch that one. I'm not going to repeat that information in one of these presentations. And then uh, another one on what's the minimum hardware and software that you can purchase in order to learn with. Because there is no free version of RS Logix or Studio 5000. Now the original manual for this course was this big thick thing. Uh, getting on close to 400 pages. I decided it was too big, too cumbersome of a binding, so I broke it into two sections. And that this is currently what we ship is fundamental programming and then programming examples. So the content in these two is basically the same as the former manual, but we did add some stuff and we did kind of reorganize it. So the fundamental programming, these lab projects are really all the fundamentals, all the fundamental instructions, all the interactions between Rungs and Logic and the data table, communications. And this one, we broke out all of the practical applications, you know, conveyors, machines, etc., and put them in here. So actually, when you do the course, you won't finish this book and then go to this book. At different spots in fundamental programming, you'll jump to projects in here. The one reason that we did it this way, broke it into the fundamental programming and programming examples was for the schools that use these manuals because some of them like to stick to this manual and then go to this one for certain things and they also have their own equipment in their classrooms and they want to use that for practical examples as well. So rather than have it all jammed into one binding in an exact sequence we broke it in two. But in the course we will tell you specifically which manual to go to and what section to do. Now, we do have another document for RS Logix 5000, and it's the Advanced Manual. This is not part of this course. We're not going to cover any of this. This is, I think, around 350 pages or so. And we are going to redo this, eliminate some of the overlap in it, because when we originally wrote it, it was with the idea that if you hadn't taken the basic stuff, but you knew the basic stuff already, you could start with this manual. So we have some of the basic stuff in the front end of it. So we're going to eliminate that. Uh, we might keep the same cover, but you see this says second edition. This is still a good manual. So those are the manuals that we're going to use. And this first lecture, we're going to look at RS Logix 5000. We'll touch on Studio, but primarily we're just looking at RS Logix 5000. Now remember uh, that Studio 5000 looks the same as RS Logix 5000 until you get up to version 30, 31, 32, and then they kind of change the format a little bit. Uh, it still works exactly the same, but the colors are different, and the graphics are slightly different, and they have some tabs, uh, which I kind of like the new interface. But for learning, you're probably going to be learning with version 20, which is strictly RS Logix 5000. Because the hardware that's the least expensive for you to learn with does not, is not supported by the newer versions. Uh, but you've not lost anything if you get like an L31 or an L32E and you learn with version 20 on that hardware platform. You will be money ahead to buy the less expensive hardware to learn with. So let's jump in here and start looking at RS Logix 5000.
This is a lecture discussion of RS Logix 5000. We're going to go through and do a cursory discovery of RS Logix 5000. We're going to discuss it first from a philosophical standpoint. That is, you look at the screen, you see we have RS Logix 5000. Looks like everything's grayed out. And notice none of it responds to a mouse over. That's because the focus is not on this window. If I click anywhere in here, now you see that these are no longer grayed out. Let's think for a minute what RS Logix 5000 is. It is the development software to develop projects for all of the processors that have the Logix engine. RS Logix 5000 is generic in the sense that it represents no particular family of processors or rev levels, revision levels for RS Logix 5000. Until we hit version 21, which is no longer called RS Logix 5000, but it's called Studio 5000. And just for fun, we will go load Studio 5000 and show you what that looks like first. Now, if you are using Studio 5000, then you're very limited as to what processors you can use. So I already have a, a project in there, Tim's Folly, but I'll say new project. Now, here's what I want you to notice. For Compact Logix, you can only use, in other words, Studio 5000 version 21 and up, only supports 5370 controllers for Compact Logix. For Control Logix, it supports the 5570, or you could say the L70 series. And we don't care about soft logix in the course of these lectures. A 1789L60, well, that's not really a controller. That is just a venue. It's a shadow of what a real L60 is as far as the executive software goes. You see, you're very limited with Studio 5000. And since we are working almost strictly with Compact Logix, that is your choice. We are using some of these 1769L1, L2, and L3 processors in some later volumes of this series. But for today, it's enough to show you that you're going to be limited for processors. You can't use any of the older processors. We'll give it a name, call it Student Intro, just so you can see and we'll save it. We gave it a name. Next. We're not going to do any of the security. We're going to say no protection. And we're going to say uh, zero modules and finish. I kind of stumbled through that a little bit because I don't use Studio 5000 much simply because most of the projects that I'm working on, working on, the customers want version 20. They, they don't want to step up and get involved in Studio 5000. For learning purposes, we really do want to stick to version 20 of RS Logic 5000. Now, you see up here it says Logic Designer, Student Intro. Okay, here's what I wanted you to see. Take a good look at this, because this is not going to look any different than what we're going to use. Look this over. You know, I just take a mental image, a snapshot. Now I'm going to close this. Okay, I just wanted you to see where you end up. Now we're back to 5000 here. I just shut down Studio 5000. We're back to RS Logix 5000. And you'll see once we create a project, it doesn't really look much different. So the graphical user interface between RS Logix 5000 and Studio 5000 has not changed much at all other than the opening images of how you select projects, select your processors, and you saw that when we opened up Studio 5000. RS Logix 5000. When you're learning to use RS Logix 5000 for the first time, and maybe the second and third, you, you want to start by imagining what it is that you want to do with RS Logix 5000. Because this is a beginner level course, we're not assuming that you have programming experience. So we're trying to get you in the mindset of learning conceptually and not procedurally. I learn everything by concept, never by procedures. The procedures come after I understand the concepts and then I think my way through what I see on the screen and that becomes a procedure. But I never memorize a procedure. It becomes instinctive but not memorized. Some people learn by procedures. They want step one, step two, step three. 
step 3a, step 3b, step, and so on. I don't learn that way. I don't teach that way. I try to teach you the concepts. If you want to develop a procedure, that's up to you. So let's look at this screen here. Remember, there's really only one thing that you can do with RS Logics 5000, and that is work with a project. A project for RS Logics 5000 contains files. If you were working with the word processor, it would be much more obvious, more apparent what the menu choices meant. But think, think of this in terms of like Microsoft Word or whatever your favorite word processor is. Up in the corner, the very first selection, notice this is grayed out again because I clicked on something else. So if I click anywhere, now these are active again. We'll start with file. And if you look down through this list, you see some of the same things that you would see, at least the first five, look very close to a word processor. New file open existing file, and of course close, save, and save as. They're grayed out because you have nothing to close, because you have nothing open. This is not to close the software. That is to close the file. Save and save as are grayed out because you don't have anything open, as I said, to close much less save or save as. Don't let some of these fool you, because if I mouse over it looks like there might be something there, but there's not. Notice that everything is grayed out. If you have no program open, you have not created a program, you know, there's really not much that you can do. I mean, there's nothing to print, and there's no print options. These choices down here, these just happen to be the projects that I worked with most recently. This one, Digital Field Device Simulator, one of the products that we sell for developing your own lab station or buying a complete lab station with digital interface and analog interface is, and this little program is just one to download into any controller to kind of test out and run your digital field device simulator through its paces. So these are the most recent projects that I've worked on. I could open up one of these from here, or I could click here and I could open and then go drilling around through my hard drive, through external hard drives, even online, and find a project somewhere that I want to open. For you, the only thing that you really have is new because you, you don't have any projects created, none to open. Now, depending on what version of software you're working with, you may have some sample programs or demo programs that you could open. We'll just assume you don't, but let's get on to edit. Well, I have nothing open, therefore there is nothing to edit. Think of your RS Logix 5000 project as a document or a package of documents. If you don't have it open, if you don't have anything created or open, there's nothing to undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, delete, insert, look at the properties up or change the properties of that document. Now remember the controller is part of that document. Later on, you'll see that this button right here is also controller properties. Controller properties, controller properties. Usually with Windows, there's more than one way to get to where you want to go, more than one path, okay. So there's nothing you can edit, view. You can set up toolbars here. See, I have toolbars. Even though I have no project open, that doesn't mean that I can't work with a basic graphical user interface like start page, watch panel, search results. But really, these are worthless right now because you don't have a project open. You could go to toolbars and tweak what toolbars are shown up here. We won't for now. And of course, you could go to search. Well, that's all grayed out. You don't have a document open. You don't have files open. There's nothing to search. You could go to logic here. You see, these are all grayed out. If you go down to verify, see it's misleading. You think that there's something there, but you're going to find they're all grayed out because there is nothing to work with. Communications. Now here you actually do have something to work with. You want to be careful what you do from here. Now, the safest thing to do is go who active. If you select recent path with no project open, it's going to select the last pathway that you worked with with RS Logics 5000. Now, if you've never worked with RS Logics 5000 before, and this is a fresh, clean, untouched license of RS Logics 5000, there is no recent path. So it's probably going to go to a default path. If you go, say, go online, that is automatically going to select the recent path. 
and try to go online with whatever processor is hanging around out there at the most recent path. It just so happens I have one out there. So I could click on that. And even though I have no project open, it will go out and find that. And then it'll want me to select a project. One thing that you may not know yet is there are no online projects, only offline projects. From an offline project, you create files or file to download into the controller, and that is a online file, an online program. But when you are looking at the program, working with the program, you're looking at the offline project. With no offline project, you aren't going to do anything. If you just try to go online with a controller right now, if it doesn't see that you have a matching project offline, you're not going online with it. We'll leave those alone for right now. And we'll just, we'll, we'll jump back here though. Well, tools, we don't want to get into discussing this, but you can see there's nothing to import. There's nothing to export because you have nothing open. Uh, there's nothing you can do with motion. And we don't want to get into discussing these tools down here. You do have options though. You could click on options and you could start changing how your graphical user interface looks. You know, the display, how the ladder editor looks, what it shows, what it doesn't show, fonts and colors. We're not going to do that right now. And then window, there's nothing. And help, well, help is always there. At this point, I don't know what you would be looking for in the way of help. However, I will tell you this. If you go to Resource Center, this can vary based on whether or not you're online. Okay, see there's a problem with Adobe Acrobat Reader. If it is running, please exit and try again. That has nothing to do with our course. So the Resource Center over here has choices. If I go to RSLogic 5000, it takes you to a web page at Rockwell Automation. You can't just wander around aimlessly through Rockwell Automation website unless you're logged in. So it will allow you into a certain distance into the website, and then you're going to have to log in. If you haven't created a, a login for Rockwell Automation, well, you have to go do that. You have to register, create a username, password, etc. Then you can wander around a little bit more. You'll see there's late breaking news. Uh, not all of these pop up something. Most of these have shown me no value personally. However, see, you can go up here and you can select for Studio 5000 Logic Designer. That's what we're in right now. Or you can check out our Logic 5000, etc. Check notes. You can search the knowledge base. This is really a handy at hand portal into this, but you're going to have to log in to actually get any information. If you want phone support, you know, you're going to find the phone numbers in here, everything ready to go. We're not going to go through the rest of these. Uh, downloads you may or may not find something. It just depends on how you're connected. Now see here, free downloads. Everybody wants to find free downloads. Well, if I go to free downloads, I'm not going to find a whole lot. Software downloads by serial number, you need a license and need to be registered. Optional tools. So here's more things that you can select. Product drawings, product selection, system configuration. Now online books, if you have those loaded, see, it's not, I've got something going on there with Adobe Reader. I'm not able to open up any of these. But if you have the online books loaded onto your hard drive, then you can access them from here. We'll let it time out to see if it's actually going to find anything. Now, I would expect the literature library that to be a link to go online to Rockwell Automation. There you go. Okay, so it does work. That has this has nothing to do with Adobe Reader because I'm opening up a web page at the Rockwell Automation website, and from here I can search and find manuals and of course catalogs. I'm not going to open this up as a matter of fact. I'm going to close the start page to get rid of it and I want to go back to communications. We did help, right? Online books. Oh, by the way, you can do vendor sample projects. Uh, that can also be interesting, except you see here that it's coming up unknown URL. This is, these are sample projects that I have loaded. So here's one generic profile example. This is for the combination analog card. So if you just slip up through here, Compact Logic's IO example. These examples are all available to you 
to download and have at your fingertips. Okay, that's this, the main menu up here. Now remember, we don't have a project. We have not selected a project. We, the start page is showing, and we could go back here, but it's, it's showing an un unknown URL. Now that may not happen on your computer simply because you have a different path or different connection. Let's go back to communication, something we could have done. I can go to Who Active, and it's going to bring up Who Active, which is really, it's the RS Who application, but it's opened up inside of RS Logics 5000, so it shows Who Active. Basically, it's just showing what drivers you have. We have a, a DF1 driver, that's RS-232, we have Ethernet. Now, this is not Ethernet IP, this is Ethernet devices. Okay, right now we're browsing DF1. If I go to this one and expand it, I'm, I'm not going to find anything because I don't have anything connected to Ethernet. If I go to this one and expand it, I'm going to show that I have a connection to a processor. Now, that doesn't mean it's an L31. That's the name of the project. And once you name the project, the name more or less sticks unless you go through some work to change it. But I definitely have a Compact Logix processor out there. And if I expand a little bit further and I go to backplane and expand the backplane and then I go to my local bus adapter. That's not actually a separate module. And L31 is a single module that connects to a power supply and then you can add additional 1769 I.O. modules. So the bus adapter is part of the processor. The bus adapter, we have a local bus, 1769 bus. So if I keep drilling down, and remember, you have no project open. I'm just, we're just going on a little discovery trip here. So here's what we found. And, and by the way, if this did not exist out there, you would see big red X's. Just for grins, I'm going to unplug that processor. I just pulled the cable loose. Bang, red X. That means it's not available. If I collapse that back down, see so saying it's trying to connect to the device. It's not going to. I'm going to cancel it because I know it's not there. Now I'm going to plug the cable back in, and eventually the driver will recognize that the processor is there and find it. The red X will disappear if you're browsing it. Okay. So the minute I clicked on it, I hadn't clicked on it. It wasn't browsing. You see these little rotating squares here. If you don't see that. This driver is not browsing. And now we're back to our processor. And we could go online. We could upload. We could update the firmware. We're not going to do anything. Well, this is just a little short discovery trip in RS Logix 5000. Depending on where you jumped into this learning process, you may or may not have had any contact with RS Lynx. The RS Lynx version that we are using may be different than the one that you're using. And there we have some good videos on the YouTube channel and in the CL100 video lecture disc set that you can purchase in the bookstore. Or you can take CL100 online course. You should have actually completed some of that before you got to this point. Because we do not explain the basics of PLC in this course. We expect you to pick that up, the generic sense of what a PLC is and how it operates, either from your own studies or from some of the free lectures on the YouTube channel, PLC Professor YouTube channel, or purchase the CL100 online course, which comes with a certificate, or you can buy all of the lectures that are the online course, but without the certificate, pre-test, post-test, etc but you have a permanent hard copy because the online course has a limited time because online courses are resident on a server out there in the cloud at a learning management system server. And we have to pay per student per month while the students are accessing that server. So if we allow the online course for an unlimited length of time, there would come a point not too far in the distant future where we would have been charged more for your activity on that LMS than what you paid for the course. We limit it to 60 days. Sometimes we renew if you just need another month to get it completed. Personally, I'd rather have the hard copies of the CO100 lectures. We're not going to cover what a PLC is, although 
we may touch it here and there. RS links. Okay, this this is RS Logics 5000, and this is where we create, work with, edit, and monitor controller projects. However, this does not have communications with a controller without RS links. So when I went up here and clicked on communications and did who active, I opened up our RS who. Well, you wouldn't be seeing this if I didn't have RS links already running and configured and communications established with that processor. If I unplug the cable, we get a red X there. There's another component here that we're going to discuss now, and that's RS links. So if I bring up RS links, and the version that I'm using is 3.51. Not all versions are compatible with all software packages. But if you purchased a license for RS Logix 5000, it came with a proper version of RS Lynx Classic Lite for you to use. Now, if I click on this little symbol right here, notice this this looks just like Who Active. And Who Active was something that we did up here. See? Who Active, see what it shows here? Except that who active allows you to do certain functions, whereas RS Who does not. You notice there's no buttons over there. And by the way, you can have as many RS Who's open at a time if you want. So you got RS Who 1 and RS Who 2. Sounds like an opportunity there for a riddle. And of course, you only need one open at a time because it's going to show you both of your drivers that are configured. Now, if you haven't configured any drivers, you're not going to see anything here. As a matter of fact, to be honest, let's go to this button. By the way, this is RSU and that's configured drivers. Those same choices are right here, RSU and configured drivers. We're going to go to configured drivers. I normally don't go to communications and then select configured drivers. I just click on the double-headed snake there. I'm going to, says it can't be deleted because it's being used. So I'm going to close RS Logix 5000. I'm going to stop it and then delete it. And I'm going to delete this one too. I'm doing this so we can start from scratch. And you just saw how to delete those. Okay, so I'll go back here and I will then, uh, there's several ways you can start RS links. You might do it from down here, from that symbol, or from your main menu, RS links classics. Classic, <laughs> classics, that's funny. <laughs> there's some classic stories for people that use RS links, but there's no RS links classics. We open up RS who, and there's nobody. And we'll click on it, but there's nobody to browse. There's no drivers to browse. So let's go to Configure Drivers, and you see we have no drivers. And we're going to pick RS-232 DF1 devices. W without exception, all Allen Bradley, i.e. Rockwell Automation, PLC controllers, PAC controllers, all have an RS-232 port somewhere on that. RS-232 is the easiest to configure. With Ethernet, sometimes you have to know the Ethernet IP and a few other things to to connect with the controller because you can't change the IP address in a controller unless you can connect with the controller. So it's like you can't call someone to tell them your address to come pick you up if you don't have their telephone number. If you don't have the IP address, you can't connect to that controller. However, with RS-232, you can almost always connect to that controller because you can do an auto configure. So you kind of go in the back door, then you go to the configuration for the ethernet port, if it has one, set up the IP, get rid of uh, boot P or DHCP so it has a fixed IP address and away you go. So let's pick RS-232 DF1 devices, add new, okay. This is where you do actually have to know something. I could pick auto configure, but I, I know what it's going to do. Unable to open specified COM port for configuration testing because COM1 is not assigned to the USB to 232 adapter I have plugged into my laptop. I'm going to go show you something here. I'm going to go to computer, I'm going to right click, 
Go to manage. There's other ways you can get to where we're going. That's one. Give it a second or two or three. Lights on, no one home. There we go. Device manager, click on device manager. And then go down to ports. And you will see that the USB serial port that we're interested in is COM4. So we go back here. We select COM4. Now we hit auto configure and voila. Now you didn't see really what was happening because it happened so fast. But we'll hit auto configure again. Watch what the first thing is you see. Whoop! It's just too fast. Well, what happened was it starts out and it uh, it, it picks a setting for th these configuration sets or these pieces of information, this setup, and it sends out a message. If it hears nothing back, it changes one, sends it out again, and it keeps doing that until it hears back. If it goes all the way down to the lowest baud rate, starts at the highest, 110, and it still doesn't find anybody, then it says, hey, we can't find anyone. Well, you click on auto configuration, it's successful. There we go. There are a variety of things that you could do. You could go to startup and decide how you want RS Links Classic to start this driver. I would leave it automatic for now. I mean, you're learning. You could have also changed the name of that driver to anything you want, including monkey dances. But I would leave it in the default name. It's a little easier to pick the right driver, you know, six months from now. You named it monkey dances. Oh, okay, monkey dances. Oh, what was I working on back then? I must have been breathing in glue or paint from the paint line or something. We'll close that. And you see now when we go to RS2, there's our ABDF1-1 driver using the DF1 protocol. There's our controller. There's our backplane, local backplane. There's the backplane bus. And there's the processor right here. Here's the processor. Now notice it says Compact Logics processor, Compact Logics processor. Well, that this is not the processor. This is. This is a placeholder to show what slot the processor is in. Now with Compact Logix 1769, there's really not slots in the sense of your thinking of slots in a chassis. We'll ignore that for right now. This is the processor. If I right click there, go to device properties, I can see that this processor, it's an L31, 5331, and it is its firmware is flashed to 20 version 20.012. Now this is something you can check without actually having RS Logics 5000 open. And you may need to do this because if this was something you bought used, which is fine, used processors work good, and it was flashed to version 13, you buy it, you're not going to be able to communicate with it because you don't have version 13. So you're going to have to flash the firmware. There's a nice video on the YouTube channel for PLC Professor that tells you how to flash the firmware. We may include one in this disk set. So there's something we wanted to know right there. Right click, device properties, close. And see if there's anything else here of interest. Nope. See, now here's where we can look at our I.O. modules. These are the actual I.O. modules that RS2 found. I can right click on them, go to device properties. I can see that's revision level to two major and one minor. I can go to this module and do the same thing. That's major revision one, minor one. When you are this far where you can expand a driver and expand your processor and see all of this, you know that your computer is communicating with that processor. That's step number one. And remember, this is how you check. Now, if you move your USB devices around, let's say you plug in something else like a keyboard into that port and put the RS-232 USB adapter into a different port, it may show up as COM7. So don't just assume it's always going to be COM4. Now let's go back to, uh, we closed RS Logic 5000 to loosen it up from 
RS Lynx. So now we're going to have to open it up again. RS Logix 5000. I'm going to drag that back over to here where it really belongs. And I think I'll drag RS Lynx Classic back over to here to make it easier to work with. I cleaned up my desktop here because it was completely covered in icons and shortcuts. Typically I have a folder called desktop. So everything you see in here <laughs> that at one time or the other was or is on my desktop. That's just to try to keep, keep it clean so it's easy to find. So let's open up our Logix 5000 again and then we've probably gone far enough on this video so we're going to stop. There's a start page but we're not using the start page and now we're to where we want to create a new project. So I'm going to pause here and we'll come back in another video to continue. Thank you.